Hi, welcome to this week's Authors Love Readers podcast, where we delve into the stories behind the stories. We're asking authors questions, some of them fun, some of them serious. And from their answers, you're going to learn things you never knew about the people who write the stories you love. My name is Patricia McGlynn. I'm your host and designated question asker. I am Rachel Grant, and I'm an author who loves readers. Now, let's start the show. Hi, and welcome to this week's Authors Love Readers podcast. I am really excited to have Rachel Grant with us this week. Um, Rachel and I, I think we knew each other some online, but not a whole lot. And then and then we hung out together yeah. at Writers Police Academy. And you you got to understand, Writers Police Academy is someplace where you come back from and you're all excited because you got to spin a car and get handcuffed. So, <laughs> so Rachel <laughs> understands that same feeling. Um, not everybody else does. <laughs> so we were simpatico. Um, so, Rachel, tell us a little bit. Clearly, you write things where it's important to know how to spin a car and be what it feels like to be handcuffed. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you write. <laughs> I primarily write um, romantic thrillers. Um, and uh, my last few books have uh, had a strong military um, connection. I mean, they're, they're romantic military thrillers uh, set in, in Africa, uh, uh, based around a uh, military base there. Um, but I'm also, I'm an archaeologist and my husband um, is an archaeologist. And so my stories um, actually really explore, their, their, I frame them as they're where archaeology, politics, and war collide. Because, uh, oh. uh, and in, in fact, my husband is, um, he's an archaeologist for the military. <laughs> so I actually know a lot about how archaeology and war <laughs> can collide. <laughs> Fascinating. I didn't know the military had archaeologists. Exactly. Not a lot of people realize that. But um, yeah, they're pretty active too. <laughs> so what are they doing? Are they making sure that the military isn't destroying archaeological sites? Or are they, yes. how, what do they do? Oh, yes. That's it. So the U.S. military um, has to uh, follow uh, basically environmental law um, here at home and at their bases abroad. And in, uh, uh, historic preservation laws fall under that umbrella of environmental laws. And so, um, so you know, mostly my husband works uh, here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, we're in Washington State. Uh, he works on a Navy base um, here, but he also... Uh, uh, does uh, travel occasionally. He went to Djibouti um, on the Horn of Africa a few years ago, which inspired yeah. my Africa set series. Um, and actually just on Monday of this week, he got back from Palau. He spent uh, almost three weeks in Palau um, in Micronesia, which was mm -hmm. uh, his, it was his um, second trip to Palau. The first time he was there was in uh, 1997. He was there for four months as we were engaged. Um, and, uh, he was working on a private contract. He wasn't working for the military then. Uh, so it was really fun for him to get to go back 21 years later. <laughs> what is the coolest thing he's ever found that's not classified? <laughs> well, you know, I have to say that the, the Djibouti project was pretty amazing because uh, as an archaeologist, I mean, we've worked all over the Pacific Northwest. Oh, and he I also haven't mentioned, he's also an underwater archaeologist. So he's like the coolest kind of archaeologist. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, um, and so he's worked on shipwrecks and, and, and things like that. But, um, but in, in the range of projects that we work here in the U.S., or, and even he's worked in Japan and he's worked in uh, Korea and American Samoa. So he's, he's done some good traveling. I haven't. He, he's done all the traveling. Um, you know, we find a lot of prehistoric Native American tools and things that are, you know, pretty cool. <sighs> but, but it's not like when he was in Africa, he, he was finding tools that were made like a million years ago by hominids, oh which is, that is mind blowing to me. That's, you know, I, he was a, allowed to bring back a tool that, um, uh, as a teaching collection, um, and he's actually done a lot of talks where he's been able to bring this tool and he's, he, and, and I've been allowed to, I've actually brought it to conferences to, to, uh, to show it to people. In fact, I meant to bring it to writer's police Academy and I totally forgot, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, 
to when he brought the tool home and he, you know, and he put it in my hand and I, I'm, I was holding in my hand an object that was made a million years ago by oh. a creature that wasn't yet human was, is astonishing, you know, and that they used this to survive. It was a tool, you know, just to me. So yeah, that's the coolest thing ever. <laughs> Now, I was focusing on him, but you are actively employed. You're not a full-time writer? I, I am a full-time writer. I haven't worked in the field since my daughter was a toddler. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I was able to, We, we uh, late 2001, we moved to Hawaii for my husband's job because he was working for the um, Army Corps of Engineers at that time. And um, and we sort of did the math and it was like, I could I can quit and stay home and raise our child. And um, and and I told him then I said, and I, I'm going to write a book. Yeah. <laughs> so that was when I started writing was was. Uh, so, yeah, I've been very lucky that I, I um, don't I don't have to work anymore in the field. <laughs> I'm happy about that. <laughs> Did you get to go to Africa with him? No, no. Uh, I just got to hear about it and see lots of photos. <laughs> and what a great resource and a, a resource. You know, a lot of us were were researching and we call somebody and you think, oh, do I want to bother them again with this small question? All you have to do is turn around. Yeah, say, pretty much. Yeah. I, have this other, I have another question. Yeah. Yeah. It was really a no brainer for me to write a book set in Djibouti. I was like, yeah, I think that's going to happen. <laughs> that's wonderful. And what has the reaction been to the books with mo the more military aspect to it? Um, it's been great. It's been great. They, Terrific. they, um, so far, two are out. They, they came out uh, last year, um, uh, and I'm uh, just I'm uh, polishing the third in that series. Uh, and what's the name of the series? The, it's the Flashpoint series, and the first book is Tinderbox, um, mm. which came out in uh, February of last year. And then this past November, Catalyst came out, and then the next one is Firestorm. That's wonderful. <laughs> now, one yeah. of my questions often is... Um, what strange jobs have you held, held or surprising jobs? I don't know if we're going to get more than that. <laughs> do you have any others? Well, I was a telemarketer in college. Uh, uh, for Sears, I sold maintenance agreements. So this would have been in like 1989. Uh, oh. It was it wasn't necessarily a strange job so much as a miserable job. Oh. <laughs> but you oh. know, it was short, so it was good. I got a job waiting tables right after that, and I was very happy. <laughs> So how did people treat you on that? Or did you learn anything about people with that? Well, the, actually, the one good thing about uh, being a telemarketer for Sears um, is selling maintenance agreements is that the people you're calling have already bought the product from Sears. So you're just selling them an add-on, you, know, you mm. know. So so basically, like the thing that we knew was if if you were selling a maintenance agreement on a lawnmower, the, the customer was going to benefit because lawnmowers always break and always need service. <laughs> but other <laughs> other products, uh, not so much. So, you know, it was it was really like, yeah, yeah. But they are, you know, they already had the product. So I wasn't trying to sell them um, a vacuum. I was trying to sell them a maintenance agreement on a vacuum. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's a little easier. Yeah. But I got to say, speaking of lawnmowers, I once did the math on how much it costs to have um, an annual fix up maintenance work on a lawnmower. Mm -hmm. And I decided it was less expensive to just run the thing into the ground. <laughs> There you go. According to my math. <laughs> Other people may not agree. Okay, let's ask you some more questions to let the, the listeners get to know you. I, I'm going to start with a book one. Most writers have a bad habit word. <laughs> some of us have more. You have to have at least one or this is going to be a really short podcast. Oh, well, it's, just, it's cursing. Um, a, a particular word oh. in general, which I won't say. Um, Thank you. But um, yeah, my my readers curse or my readers and my readers don't curse at all as far as I know. Um, my um, my characters. They might. They might. They might. My characters curse a lot, especially in the first draft. In the first draft, I really sort of just don't worry about it. And, um, and then the second draft, I try to, um, tone it down, um, find, you know, other ways to say it. Um, but I still tend to keep a, a lot in because, um, well, one cursing is actually military. It's military and cursing is actually sort of a known stress reliever. It is how people express themselves. Uh, so yeah, it's my, my characters curse more than I do, but, um, 
Uh, but I, as my kids have gotten older, I, I, I curse a lot more than I used to, too. <laughs> For the listeners, it, it's so interesting because you look so sweet. <laughs> you do. You look absolutely sweet. And so it has more impact in some ways, I think. Wow. That's on, on another podcast I talked with somebody about, I had read this article, that there are three kinds of cursing. There is uh, religious sexual and scatological mm -hmm. and that most people usually focus on one of the three mm. and that people tend to be have um they are offended at different levels by the three oh, interesting yeah that makes sense and i i realize that the the sexual tends to bother me mm. more because it is directed yeah and at the other person <laughs> So, you know, and that's interesting because when I do use it in a sexual context, it's not an insult. It's mm. always like, and, and yeah, you know, it's, it's not, it's, I would never, ever use it as an insult in a sexual, you know, you know if that makes sense. Because yeah, that yes. would bother me and too, I, especially if my hero's saying, you know, yeah, woo, no. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get more cheerful. What's your favorite color? And do you have a reason why? I'm, my my favorite color is more of a rainbow color. So I I don't have a specific favorite color now as much as I used to. Now it's more blue, greens, and purples, and it really kind of depends on the mood. I think, just you mm -hmm. know, on what's appealing to me at the time. So yeah, um, sort of in that that hue range. <laughs> What did it used to be? Uh, when I was really young, um, it was blue for a long time. And then I went through a red phase. <laughs> then uh. there was an orange phase. But yeah, yeah, it's, you know, so, so I, 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 I thought about that. And I was like, do I have a favorite color? You know, I, no, it really, really depends on, um, on the shade for starters and the mood. Two nieces and, and in their young childhood days, they loved pink and purple, each of them mm -hmm. separately love pink and purple, which are my least favorite colors. <laughs> and when I would get them presents in those colors, it's, boy, this is a sign of true love. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how about a taste? Do you have something that you just, you crave or that just really hits the spot for you? I gravitate towards salty snacks kind of thing. I mean, I love, I love desserts, but I can have, you know, three bites of dessert and I'd be done. You know, like it's, that's like satisfying enough, but, but man, you, you put a, a bag of um, natural uh, Cheetos, the, 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 nat <laughs> the natural ones in front of me, and I will inhale half the bag before I've, you know, even come up for air. <laughs> the next question for you is a really important one. You're left-handed or right-handed? <laughs> I am left-handed. You are left-handed. Oh, I, I think you may, you're one of the few. So is your index finger or your ring finger longer? My ring finger is longer. Do you know what that means? <laughs> nope. <laughs> Me either. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to find out though, but I think it's interesting. And you're one, you're one of the few left-handers we've had. So oh. far. Yeah. It's been, I've been surprised at how dominant right-handed has been. Has that being left-handed, has that caused you issues during your life or, or specifically in writing? Um, not in writing, um, but in sports growing up, uh, they never had the left-handed glove for baseball. So I really um. dislike playing softball and baseball, <laughs> just, you know, things like that. There, there, it just, um, I was, um, you know, I, I remember like, you know, learning to throw a football and my teachers wouldn't adapt to throw left-handed. Like, like it was, it was very interesting to see how just they, they weren't even going to try, you know, so, so I can actually throw a football with either hand. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good for you. Um, you know, things like that. But yeah, I, uh, it was it was mostly there. I, I did, I had a few experiences in my working life. Um, I'm a mouse person. I can't work on a computer, um, even a laptop without a, a mouse. I, I don't use the touchpad and I mouse all the time. 
So, um, oh, so actually looking for a good portable laptop tray that has a mouse pad um, uh, tray on the, oh. the left side was very hard to find, but I have a great one. And so <laughs> I, I, I should actually, I've, I've tweeted about it because I finally found one. I mean, I've been looking for years, literally, because um, I wanted a tray that would actually, you know, fit in a, in a uh, laptop bag. I wanted one that I could carry yeah. with me. And, uh, but I, so I finally found a, a great one that's both both left and right-handed. Um, so that, that was, that was actually pretty big. And then the, uh, but anyways, I was going to say that in, in my work experience, there were, there were times back when I was uh, working as an archeologist and I was in the, in the lab and in the office a lot. And whenever I'd have an issue, I had, I had one coworker in particular who would get very irritated when she was trying to show me something on my computer and my mouse yeah. was on the wrong side for her. <laughs> <laughs> on your and, computer. And on my computer. And then she would she would gripe at me and she'd say, You're not very ambidextrous, are you? And I would just I just looked at her, I was like, you know, I'm probably more ambidextrous than you uh -huh. are. You just expect <laughs> me to be. <laughs> and so yeah. it's things like that. There's you know uh -huh. <laughs> Well, my advice on the on the tray is to buy several now. And I did pile <laughs> Oh, you did. did, smart girl, because sure <laughs> shoot, and they will go out of out of business and they won't exist anymore. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any strong fears mm. other than unkind co coworkers who gripe at you un <laughs> unwarrantedly? Uh, uh, mountain passes past roads that uh, are very narrow with no guardrail. Those can be really terrifying. That's very specific. <laughs> it's very specific. Yes. <laughs> I, I've been on some of those roads, and, and my preference is that I want to be the the driver. And I, I've gone on trips with various people, like through the Rockies and stuff. Mm -hmm. And they say, "Well, oh, you want to be the driver because you're in charge." And I said, "No, because I'm farther away from the edge." edge. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yes, I do want to be in charge too. But yeah. <laughs> did you have a childhood book that you can trace back to and go, "Oh, that's." That's when stories got me. That was the one. Um, I was 11 or 12 years old when I read Whispers by Dean Koontz. <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't like children's books much. I mean, I read a few here and there. But so there I was. And I, I, I think I was uh, in sixth grade at the, the end of sixth grade. So I was pretty young. Um, but I remember I read Whispers and it basically blew me away. Um, and, mm. and that was, and then I read right after that, I read a book by Mary Higgins Clark and, um, yeah, so I was hooked. That was it. I, yeah. You, you got right into those yeah. scary things. I did. Mm. I did. I read a lot. I don't, I don't read, like I read uh, from, from Dean Koontz and then I read, uh, Peter Straub and, um, mm. John Saul. I was definitely more into horror than I didn't read much Stephen King. It did. I, I read a few of his books, but, um, but for some reason his never had grabbed me as much as, as, uh, Dean Koontz. I always admired, I, I do not particularly like being horror or, or mm -hmm. scary things. And, uh, but I admired Dean Koontz's writing and Peter Straub. So I had yeah. family members who loved uh, those kind of books. And I'd always say, uh, you know, I won't read them, but I'll get yeah. them for you. <laughs> well, you know, and, and I, I haven't read a Kuntz book um, in, in decades. Um, and I haven't read a Straub book in decades either, now that I think about it. Um, and it's just because my taste in fiction has changed. But at the mm -hmm. time, it was exactly what I wanted. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah. Now, I have this odd little desert island that mm -hmm. you can't get off of. But you can play movies. Uh, uh, unfortunately, you can only have three movies forevermore, <laughs> but, and yet it plays these movies. So which three movies? Because now I'm curious if you're going to get scary ones. Or oh, uh, I, I thought a lot about this one. It was just so hard. So I'm going to go with Star Wars because it uh, fulfilled a deep-seated childhood need. Like Star Wars shaped my childhood. Uh, so the first one, you know, the, the, the first released movie. Um, and then my second movie is one that, that well, I, I say, should say this one is the one that's, that uh, has fulfilled a deep-seated childhood need, which is Wonder Woman. 
I mean, I, I oh. loved Wonder Woman as a child. And if I'd had a movie like that when I was, I, I would have, and I see my daughter's reaction to watching Wonder Woman. And yeah, I, yeah. So that would be, those, those are the first two. And then it was much harder to choose a third. Uh, basically, I was trying to decide between any of the Captain America movies or The Mummy, the one with Brendan Fraser and Rachel Weisz. <laughs> So I wow. guess the mummy would kind of be a horror movie, kind of. <laughs> well, but, it's, but you know, I see a lot I of the action the adventure. Yeah, in there. exactly. The romance, yeah. the action adventure, <laughs> the archaeology, sort of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Those make total sense, and the and and I can see the three of them together. Yeah. So you now you backed off. You initially said that Star Wars met a deep seated need. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I um it. It was, it, it, it shaped my childhood. And then, and in what then, way? Uh, I, I saw a princess who was powerful and, um, you know, just, uh, I wish there were more women characters, <laughs> but it was mm. great that there was one and that she was strong and she was integral to the story. Um, and so, you know, we, I played star, I, I was, uh, I think I was seven, six, I was six or seven when star Wars released. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was, it, that was always who I wanted to be when we were playing, um, any, any pretend game. And I loved playing make-believe when I was a kid. I mean, I guess I was a storyteller then. And I always wanted to, 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 to my, my make-believe games as a child always involved falling in love. <laughs> So I guess yeah. I was a romantic even then. <laughs> and did you play those games with other kids? Yeah. In the yeah. neighborhood? But okay. we would spend okay. all of our time planning the story and then never actually play. <laughs> okay. And so then this is going to happen. <laughs> you know, that kind of <laughs> We planning. used to do, we had um, plastic um, horses or wild animals. Mm -hmm. and, and we would do stories with those. And we had these these big sagas not so much we did dolls a little bit but but more with the we played plastic animals and the other thing we would do is we had a um a clubhouse called fort pioneer in my backyard actually long story my mother after fort pioneer was built my mother said i will never again doubt that you will accomplish whatever you put your mind <laughs> to because she said yes we could have it in their yard thinking it would never happen so <laughs> <laughs> She suffered. Um, and we used to have plays. And what we would do is we would invite the parents to come. And once the parents were seated for the play, then we would all run home and take cookies from our homes and come back and sell them to them. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, I should have gone into business. Yeah. You know? <laughs> That's great. Do you have any quotes, motivational or upbeat that you really love and live by? I'm wondering if you've got another life shaper here. Well, um, this one's sort of a joke, but I kind of sort of mean it. It's uh, Never Give Up, Never Surrender from Galaxy Quest. <laughs> I love that movie. I just saw it the other day and it makes me laugh every time. I, I think that. I it's think a it's, it's a perfect movie. It does it yeah. fills everything it promises yeah. to be, and then does it even a little better than you expected. Yeah, just, I, 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 love I, I love the guy who's who knows that he's the um, he's the un, no die? last name because yeah. he's going to die. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. That's my and, favorite and then at one point, um, Sigourney Weaver says, "Have you ever thought maybe you were the plucky comic relief?" <laughs> and he's like, "Oh, okay." <laughs> <laughs> and he just won an Oscar. Yeah. I love it that yes. he just won an Oscar because yeah. <laughs> he yeah. was so great in that. <laughs> That's Sam Sam Rockwell? I think no? so. Yeah, I, I never yeah, remember I his so name because he's, yeah. he's that character actor. Because you know? he's Guy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's Guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, as long as we're talking about movies and, and quotes and um, how about uh, a song? Do you have a song that you think mm. helps – that reveals your inner soul to the listeners. Well, <laughs> no that's, pressure. Again, that's a that's a hard one. I tend to glom onto songs um, more, in particular, like when I'm writing. Like if I'm looking for a song that kind of fits the story or that I want to mention in the story. Of course, I can't use lyrics, but but just to to bring something to mind. And of course, so I've just I. I, I just finished and I'm currently polishing a book that is uh, set in uh, Tanzania and, and uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. 
And so the wow. song that that came to mind immediately as I was as I was drafting was Africa by Toto. <laughs> so I've been listening uh, to that a lot lately. <laughs> yeah, and so I, most readers and listeners probably understand, but in case there are any who don't, if if an author quotes a song, we have to pay the songwriter or whoever holds the the rights to the song lots of money. Yeah, <laughs> we have yeah. to we have to get their permission and. Um, that permission is usually only granted for a lot more money than we can afford. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Once in a while, somebody gets a, a, um, a really wonderful understanding um, musician or, or rights holder, because it's not always the musician, unfortunately, um, who holds the rights, but very seldom. So a lot of times we use the title because, you know, you use the title and everybody starts singing the head, the story in their yeah. head. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. They can feel it, especially if it's a song like, say, Africa, that most mm. people are are aware of. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. And now you play that while you're while you're writing certain scenes, certain scenes where it mm. um, I, I, it was a <laughs> it was a little uh, it, it can it can get a little ridiculous because there was there was one section in the book where I that was basically the um, the the beat and the emotion of the song was sort of how I, I wanted the the reader to feel that as they were reading the scene because I have I have my characters they're on a barge going down the Congo River <laughs> <laughs> um, and and these barges are their um, their cargo barges, but uh, but people can pay for passage, um, and so they're overloaded. Like they'll have like two hundred people on them, and I mean there it's it's crazy. I looked up so many pictures and was reading so many accounts of people traveling on these barges, and I just you know and I had that song in my head, so I had it on this repeat loop. And my daughter was, what? Why do you keep listening to that song? <laughs> <laughs> it's called art, honey. <laughs> I'm creating. I see, and I have admitted previously that if I have music on that has lyrics, it, it, there's no hope. I start typing the lyrics. Oh, interesting. I, I, yeah. <laughs> no matter what my mind says, I should be typing the, the lyrics start coming out. So I can only do instrumental. Uh, um, yes. When I'm writing. If you know, I, I don't know if you've ever tried it. I I've recently started doing this. Uh, I've started listening to in the movie scores. Um, yes. While writing, because again, they, they tell a story themselves, but there's no words and, and yeah, right. it can help shape your mood as you're writing, which is great. Yeah. They have that, the variation of, of tempo and mood. And, um, but one of the things I have trouble with, I keep finding one that trying to find ones that are really good for a kind of mysteries, but I don't want really um, dour mysteries. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. kind of happy, <laughs> happy <laughs> murdered people. Um, and, and it, that can be very difficult to find. I found, I, you know, I had, I had sort of a, a core group of, I still listen to CDs. So a core group of CDs that I would listen to for romances. And I'm having a, a little harder time finding that the right mix for the mm -hmm. mysteries because pieces like, like something like by North by Northwest Mm -hmm. I love that music, but the whole movie score isn't quite right or charade, you know, mm, a piece of yeah, it, but yeah. not the whole thing. Um, <laughs> at Laura, that movie, I like it. But again, a piece of it. I don't want to hear. Yeah, you, you <laughs> need an hour and a half. Of, <laughs> yeah, I do. And I, yeah. I am not the technical wizard to do that. So um, someday, someday that'll happen. Okay, I want to get into some questions from readers, and you know this is this is a classic one. So I will let the reader ask it in her words, which is, "Where do your stories come from?" I know one author who dreams her stories, and this is an aside from me. Um, I wish, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the, um, it, continuing from the reader, another has a character suddenly taking up residence in her head. So how are your beautiful stories born? Well, um, my background as an archaeologist and my husband's work um, is often a starting point. And the things that I will look at as I'm starting a new story, and I actually was doing this just last week because I had a lull as I was waiting for critiques back. And I was like, I need to start plotting the book that I'm going to be working on next. And um, so I was like, oh, what's it going to be about? And and I knew it was going to be that it's going to it's going to be the eighth book in um, an, a different ongoing 
in my evidence series. And so the first thing, you know, is like I knew who the hero was going to be because he's been introduced in several books. And so then I just ask myself, okay, what type of archaeology or anthropology have I not written about yet? Because mm. um, I try to, I try to present um, uh, the profession, basically things that people don't realize that um, uh, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of misinformation about out there about what archaeologists really do. And so I try to show different aspects of the profession in ways that people don't expect. So that's one place where I start. And then the other is setting. I look at, okay, well, what place do I want to write about? What, and, and often, so for example, the book that um, I, I've just written that takes place in Congo, um, I wasn't sure where in Africa the story was going to be set. Um, but I, uh, I, I had some parameters for what I wanted and I started researching, um, uh, different countries and what, you know, what their issues were. And then once I decided on, on Congo, uh, then that opened, you know, the floodgates for the, for the plot to follow, because, you know, then I started researching, you know, the first Con Congo war, the second Congo war, the Rwandan genocide and all of these things, uh, play a part. My stories, they, they can have, um, a heavy backdrop, <laughs> but, yes. um, but I, you know, I, I, I it, but at the same time, I'm, I'm trying to, to, uh, provide a little context for things that we don't necessarily know about as Americans, um, and, and, uh, and, and feed that in to the story. So, yeah, so it really, it comes from, from decisions on setting and type of archeology. <laughs> I had multiple follow-up questions from that. Okay. Uh, one is, and I'm going to sort of take them backwards. The research is one. Uh, do you find, because you, you're, those are very um, difficult topics, do you find that that research has an impact on your everyday mood? How do you do research like that without having it, you know, really depress you? And and taking the research from a generalized horrific to what you need for specific story and people it it definitely affects my my mood and my take on the world when i read about um when when i when i start delving into research the the book that's prior to this congo set book is is actually set in south sudan and i knew basically next to nothing about South Sudan when I started. And, you know, the first thing, if you look up South Sudan, the first thing you might see is, well, they're in the middle of a civil war right now. The second thing you'll see is that they gained ind independence in um, 2011. They became the world's newest democracy. And then the civil war started in 2013. <laughs> so they were a democracy for all of two years before they, they uh, fell into this civil war and um, and then from there, it's it's they're facing famine, and it's it's heartbreaking. It's it you know, and and it became important to me to shine a light on that. I and that was one thing that I realized as I as I was trying to write this story, as you know, like uh, how do I write a sexy story set in South Sudan? Um, I was looking at ways. Well, I I can't give South Sudan a happy ending. You know, I, mm -hmm. I, I mm -hmm. you know, I, I can't do that, but I can shine a light. I can, I can bring it to people's attention. And there were a few issues that, that uh, my research um, that became focal to the storyline um, as far as uh, girls in the developing world often um, drop out of school at the age of, of 12 or 13 because they get their period and they have no way to manage their period um, in a mm. sanitary way. And a lot of people, I didn't realize that that, you know, that uh, it, it can often be cited, you know, people think that it's a societal thing. Well, they think that girls don't need an education and that's why they're dropping out. But no, it's actually that <laughs> they have their period and they, there's nothing mm. that they can do about it. And, and it's such a simple thing to, to that, that can be fixed. Um, and, and so I, I, that became a part of the story. And in the author's note, I named some charities <laughs> that you can donate to, uh, to, yeah. you know, for menstrual products for, for adolescent girls. And it's, you know, it's not just a South Sudan problem. South Sudan has a ton of problems, but it's also, you know, in, in India and sub-Saharan Africa. And there's just so many places in the world where girls are not going or, or, or don't have access to an education because 
because they they can't manage their periods. And so I focus on that. Like, what can I do? Well, I can give news mm. at the back of the book, <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and again, I can shine a light and let people know this is really happening in this place. And, you know, and I still try to, you know, I, I still do have a, a romance taking place where you see these people who are coming together in the midst of all of this. And, and as they're in that situation, they're, they're relating to what's going on around them and everything. And so, so mm-hmm. it's just, you know, like I promise readers, there is, it's not, um, it's not hard to read the book because you're just depressed. Like, you know, there's, there, there are, there is light and there's joy in the story as well. <laughs> um, oh, I'm sure. I, I was sure there was in yeah, your story. Yeah. And, and, but it's about, and that people, yes. To find and, that. And people, you know, if, if people didn't fall in love and form committed relationships in, extremely challenging circumstances, humanity would have died out a long time ago. Exactly. And for me, it's also really important when I'm, when I'm studying a a setting and, and it is, it's very research intensive. I was going to say, I listen to a lot of audiobooks. I listen to, um, to really long audiobooks that, you know, I, I, uh, about, you know, the, the first and second Congo war. <laughs> and, and then mm. I watch a lot of YouTube videos. I watch documentaries, any, anything I can find. And, and in that process, even though I'm reading about things that, um, are really, uh, terrible and difficult, I'm also falling in love with the setting. I want to ride on a barge on the Congo river so badly. Mm. <laughs> I just wow. think it would be amazing. And there's so much that's amazing about Congo. Um, it's heartbreaking, but it is, it sounds incredible. And a, as you know, same with South Sudan, <laughs> I, I want to visit these places. <laughs> they have a part of well, my the, heart. <laughs> the other follow-up question I had from, from what you were talking about earlier, where you were saying you'd introduced this character in a previous book. So you knew who the hero was going to be or in previous books, plural. Mm-hmm. And one of our readers has asked if we miss our characters when we're done with a book. And I'm always curious if that is then what causes it. I, I know it causes me to write additional books. And I'm curious about other authors. If that missing those characters, then you think I they need their book. Yeah. They need a book and I'm going to find a story for them. Well, I do. I miss the main characters. When I have when I reach the end of of writing um, a book, I have fallen in love with the both of the main characters, and so I do miss them, especially when I those during the the publication, you know, uh, phase where you're first releasing the book and it's out there, and I know that oh, other people are going to get to meet them and mm-hmm. fall in love with them too, <laughs> and it's just you know, and yeah, and I I really miss them then, but it doesn't necessarily. Uh, play over into how I use those characters in future books. I I will introduce characters that I'm not in love with yet, <laughs> but that I think I'm going to like a lot <laughs> um, in oh. early books and knowing that I'm going to use them later. But I don't fall in love with them until I'm writing about them. And then I only, I do bring in previous characters because I know that readers want to see that, but I try to limit it to really uh, keeping it to what's necessary for the story because um, sometimes uh, I I, I, you know, some, some, some books feel like they get overcrowded with previous heroes and heroines coming <laughs> on the page. And it's like, you know, the, this isn't their story. And, and so, so some books will really need those other characters because they're playing a role, especially in suspense. You know, you can, you can have mm-hmm. lots of specialized mm-hmm. uh, skills coming into play. And so then, and so then there'll be like a whole cast who's, who's coming back and playing a role. And then other times they'll just like be, you know, appear in a phone call, you know, so. I had a, book out last year 2017 called uh, a cowboy wedding Uh and it was the classic bringing all the everybody came to the wedding you know (laughs) what are you gonna do i couldn't leave past characters out of the wedding and i and i actually warned readers that if you have not been reading this series you might not want to start with this book (laughs) you know this is this is sort of a fun party for the people who love the series it's so funny that you say that because i actually have decided that this next book is going to start with a previous couple's wedding because i haven't done that i haven't shown and 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 so then I was like, well, then that'll bring oh this carry. So basically, that was exactly it. Yeah. I, they were yeah. they're all going to be at least in the opening scenes. 
<laughs> and then the, yeah. and, and then the the ones that I don't need will will go away. <laughs> Well, it was it was a lot of fun to write the characters. I did realize um, I, I may be past the point where I enjoy planning weddings, and I had to plan this whole wedding. <laughs> and I kept saying, it's simple and really laid back, and yet there were more things to plan for the wedding. <laughs> but, uh, but it was a lot of fun to have all the characters show up, and I, I was having a ball with it. I just thought, the poor reader, if the uh, if somebody picks that up, it's the very first book. It's going to be like, you know, where you go to a wedding with a bun- bunch of friends and you're the date of one of them. Yeah. And you just maybe you've only been dating him for a while. And uh, <laughs> holy moly, who are all these strangers? And they're all having a great time. And, you know, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, do you have a, do you have a lot of story ideas? Do you have a backlog of story ideas? And you, you know what's going to come next? and. I I know what's going to come next in my Flashpoint series. I have a basically a, a, a trilogy. Uh, so that I've just done three books, and and then the next the next three books are also going to be a trilogy. So I I kind of know what's coming up there. Um, for my evidence books, um, I I you know I I have a vague idea of you know who I want to feature and and where that's going to go. But as far as like you know books that I've started and then, you know, put under the bed or whatever, I actually have one 50 page, uh, uh, start to a young adult novel that I wrote several years ago mm. that I then realized that young adult isn't going to be my genre, but everything else that I've ever started writing, I have finished and published. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's impressive. So, and you haven't thrown out the young adult yet. I haven't. But I also don't have it on my radar of something that I I plan to to pick up. Okay, here's what occurs to me immediately: you write a character who is a young adult author, ah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you give that you you give those first fifty pages yeah, to your readers. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I like to recycle. <laughs> I I still have a few. I I have a box in my in my closet of things in it. And I haven't figured out how to use them yet, but yet is the operative (laughs) word. I'm going to get there. So here's another question. Actually, these are questions from two different readers, but I'm going to sort of put them together because they, they hit, well, for me, anyhow, they hit some of the same angst notes. (laughs) So one reader says when the cover image doesn't match the character description, and that reader says it's a pet peeve. How does it feel for the author? And the other one is how much does it bother you to find editing errors after your book is out? Mm. Well, so this is where I can say that I'm quite lucky as a um, self-published author that uh, when I, there have been times when I haven't been able to find a uh, stock photo of a couple that that really fit the characters. So I changed the character description. <laughs> oh my so, goodness. Yeah. I have, I have gone back and changed the, I mean, you know, it's, it's little things like, you know, well, she had, she was supposed to have really short hair. Well, now she has long hair. It's not going to change anything about the story except for the hair mm-hmm. length. Uh, so things like that. You aren't that. as stubborn as I am. <laughs> <laughs> and then my, my uh, Flashpoint books don't have people on the cover. So whoo, <laughs> that was, there was a yeah. freedom to that too. It's like, oh, I can just, there is. I have a short haired heroine there. <laughs> really short <laughs> too. Um but and then the typos the same kind of thing. Uh, it's kind of horrifying when you first catch it, uh, but at least I can fix them. Although I will say, I I read a review for Catalyst and I read and the review was it was probably like a month after or it was, it was within a few weeks of release where it was pointed out that the word chauffeur was spelled wrong in every single instance and I was like cringing. <laughs> Apparently, there's oh. another word that's spelled almost exactly like chauffeur, and you know, I missed it. My editor missed it. You know, I mean, you name it. So, um, and I wanted to fix it right away, but something that um, again, readers uh, probably don't know is that if you um, re-upload a book uh, at Amazon during that first 30 days when their algorithms are going crazy, it pulls it out of the algorithm 
And um, so it can really mess with your I don't think I sales. knew that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I don't think can, I knew that. Oh. I, I, I have gotten bitten by that one uh, before by myself. And then another time I was in a box set. Um, and, and once it's pulled out of the algorithm, uh, it's hard to, for it to find its traction back in there. And so I don't Oops. re-upload a book after in that first 30 days. I just don't. And in fact, I try to avoid it the first 90 days just because you're still in that new release period. So I didn't fix it actually until a few weeks ago. <laughs> and it, it did bother me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it it's was a, there, it's, it's... you know, but it was like, well, hopefully not a lot of people know how to spell chauffeur. <laughs> Well, that is that is really interesting because I know I have swapped books out in the mm. in the first absolutely in the first ninety and a, a couple in the first thirty. One for particular reason that was it was all my fault. It was hands crossing and the wrong file got in. Oh, and I, yikes, I yeah. would do it again. Oh, I yeah, would do yeah. It again. yeah. There are times and when you was, just can't avoid it. Was, it. <laughs> it was still a complete book, but it was not the the polished one yeah. that it should have been. So yeah. you know, I, I will. No regrets about that one. A couple other ones, I'm thinking, hmm, but how can it's done? Yeah. <laughs> Gone. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, from your beginning and, and when you're working on the story, do they change a lot from your initial conception to when you actually put the book out there to the world? Um, they can. In fact, they used to a lot. Uh, my writing process has, has changed in that I'm much better at envisioning. Um, in, in the first draft, uh, you know, where it's going to go. But, but, but yeah, it's, uh, I've, I've had books that, um, for a long time, I, I, I didn't want my agent to put me out on submission on a partial just because it was that feeling of, well, well, I, I, I don't know how it's going to end, <laughs> you know? And so she would only put me yeah. out on submission for completed books. Um, now I'm much more confident in my, my writing and craft. And I know that, you know, I, I, I'm much closer to knowing where it's going to go. And so I can write synopses for, for books like that. But a lot of books like this book that um, I'm, the next book I'm about to start, I probably won't write a synopsis before I start writing. I probably won't try to plot it out much. I, I usually try to look at what the first and the second turning point will be. And, and then after I figured out those, I might have a good idea of what the black moment is going to be. I always know the villain. Like I know, I know who the villain is going to be before I start. Um, because if you don't, that can make it really hard. <laughs> Well, I, I often don't, and yeah. I'm writing murder mysteries, yeah. and I, uh, I, I had the the classic case with a uh, the murder mystery backstory. I thought I knew who the murderer uh -huh. was, and I'm writing along, and I was actually ahead of time. I was ahead of schedule. Uh -huh. and I'm writing along, and I'm looking at the screen as I'm writing, and lo and behold, the one I thought was the murderer ended up dead. <laughs> and I can remember looking at the screen, going, "This is a problem." This is, uh oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so I, I had to do some scrambling, but you're being, you're more confident mm -hmm. now that you're, that you're writing, but do you, do you, has your process in other ways changed? Is there, um, not writing a synopsis of course is part of the process, but I'm, I'm also thinking, are there areas where you feel, um, uh, at the beginning I wasn't so sure about dialogue and now I love dialogue or whatever. Is, yeah. Are there things that have changed? from when you first started being published? Well, one thing that I have, that, that has been a huge shift in, in my process is that I used to write draft after draft after draft. And, um, and I, there's even, there's one book in particular where basically I threw away about 90,000 words of a 98,000 wow. word manuscript. <laughs> Uh, I kept the characters in the setting um, and a lot of the conflict, but all of the scenes ended up being different. <laughs> um, and even wow. even the scenes that I kept had the wrong tone, and so so they were they were you know pretty much rewritten. Um, and I've and I've and multiple times that was only one book that I've done that with, um, but multiple times I've written a whole book and then thrown away the last fifty thousand words and then and then redone it. And so basically, once I was published, I can't afford to do that anymore. That's a lot of wasted mm -hmm. writing time. And so one thing I have learned to do is uh, to stop when I recognize that I'm starting to write off the rails, like where where 
something just feels off and maybe the last scene or two isn't really going in the right direction. I mean, I used to be able to write another 25, 30,000 words after that di- diver- diversion of the story. Oh, and now oh. I'm, I'm like, nope, nope, not going to do that. And so I'll give myself a day or two to pace around the house and talk to myself and, and try to find, try to figure out exactly where I went off track. And go back to that point and then and then start rewriting from there. And so I might dump five, even even ten thousand words, although rarely that much anymore. Um, but but I'll I'll dump some of the words I've written, but it's not like dumping half a book. And it's not like wasting a month of writing time writing half of a book versus, mm. you know, three days, three days of writing time. So so you're recognizing yeah. going off the rails yeah. much I, earlier. Yeah, I can yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and and actually that, that I started to to recognize that when I was at the point where I was rewriting that book that I had dumped so much that every every time I would get to a point where I was really struggling, I, I would pull back because I, I my my temptation was to just keep writing. Well, I can, you know, I can I'll, I'll keep writing and I'll figure it out later. <laughs> that doesn't work. Do you write in sequence? Do you yeah, start do. at the beginning and work all the way to the end? Oh, okay. Yeah, You're I do. One of those. Very, very <laughs> rarely will I will I write out of order. Uh, the, there might be a scene or something that I'll jot notes down because I see it, you know. But but even then, I'm not writing the scene. I'm just writing the notes. So I find that uh, I write out of order. Oh, wow. and yet um, when I am finishing a book and then I, I'm cutting and adding and cutting and adding and cutting and adding, and I can tell almost. Maybe eighty percent of what I cut is what I wrote early in the process. Mm. It's always it's always that kind of writing my way into the mm-hmm. into the guts of the story, and it it just takes me a while. And then once I once I really get it, then I'm not cutting that as mu- anywhere near. I'm still editing it, of course, but that chunks aren't coming out of that. Those are the right chunks. Yeah, it's not very efficient, but. <laughs> It's the way it works. So what for you is the most difficult part of the writing process? And you can also say what <laughs> whatever part fun. I'm in, write that. No, um <laughs> it's <laughs> I love revising. I do. I love revising because at that point I already know the characters, et cetera. So I would I guess it's really just that first draft. It's it's figuring out how to make all the threads come together. Um and I love a complex story, um, and and so so there's there's a lot of yeah a lot of a lot of pressure I put on myself. You know I, you know I want my first drafts to be perfect, and they never are. You know, and 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 I'm learning to accept my process a lot more, and just know, hey, you know, it's, it's my process, and it works. <laughs> but um, yeah. that acceptance is big. Yeah. yeah. Do, now you're writing um, guys, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have a certain approach to writing characters of the opposite sex? I don't think I ever really thought about it at first. So I was already um, writing uh, uh, before before it occurred to me that I needed to you know, to you know maybe check in with my husband a little bit. Like, <laughs> what a guy use that word, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but I I've recently started writing um, characters with a different ethnic background from myself. And, um, mm. and I think that it's sort of, you know, it should be the same approach, which is just that, that seeking authenticity, you know, I mean, I, I'm, I, I, I am not going to, that my, my hero in um, Catalyst is uh, Native American and I, I can't, you know, I'm not a Native American man. <laughs> so, right. so, but I can do my best to, um, to, to uh, treat him with respect and and you know aim for as much authentic authenticity as I can as I can get. And I had I did uh, um, ask uh, a a some uh, a Native American to do a, a beta read, and um, she provided some great feedback. Mm-hmm. And and you know it just yeah. It's, uh, and my, you know, and in the same token, I guess I could say, well, my husband also always reads my, you know, my my books before they're they're published as well so he he does occasionally give me the guy feedback <laughs> so <laughs> the, the difficult i was thinking is both well i'm i'm arguing with myself in my head so <laughs> sorry, that's why i got quiet because i'm thinking you know your husband reads it he's one guy mm. that's his experience, his experience. That's exactly guy. other people have have different experiences of being a guy and there's no way on earth any of us can write 
a character who is going to reflect exactly everybody's exactly. experience exactly. of being a guy. Yeah. So, uh, or a Native American, or you know, anything else. Exactly. I mean, a, a journalist and, and I, for me, or, you know. And, and, and I certainly wouldn't wouldn't view the fact that that I had a sensitivity read done to be like endorsement or or saying you know like I'm not going to hold that up as a shield of yeah but no because I still have to own anything that I got wrong any language that's offensive or whatever uh, because just because it it didn't offend her doesn't mean it's not going to offend somebody right. else and it's on me you know yeah you know if we wrote if we wrote solely not to offend anybody mm -hmm. i don't think we could write the word the yeah i think exactly. you know maybe not even uh yeah. <laughs> you know I, you, it just can't be done mm -hmm. um and, and i think that's that can be an issue too where as a reader i catch myself sometimes being aware that my experience of something other people had different experiences of mm -hmm. it if it you know if it's talking about you know going to school at a certain era and time I, i'm i'm always taken aback when people you know talk about if it was difficult being in high school or whatever and i think well i had a good time you know yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> but that was my experience so I, I think we all have to be more both as writers and readers be more open to other people's individual experiences. So if the experience is right for that character, mm -hmm. maybe that's what I'm getting to. And and it, there are other things that I took into consideration like so I'm I wrote a Native American character but the place where he is in the story is South Sudan. So I wasn't trying to write about the Native American mm -hmm. experience of living on a reservation here right. in the US because that's not my story to tell. And so that's the other thing I think is just to, to be aware of when we're, when, you know, it's, I, I think I, I, I want to write more diverse characters. I, you know, I want to make that uh, uh, much more part of my work, but I also need to be mindful of what is my story to tell and, and, you know, what is not. So. Okay. Another writer asks us, and this, and some of this has to do sort of informs process too, I think. Another writer asks where you write and if you have, oh, they, which I, I find this really kind. They want to know if we have an inspirational view. Um, and then, and then I will talk, I want you to also talk about from the where, talk about your routine and, and how that fits into your process too. I write wherever the mojo is in my house. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I have an office. I'm actually in my office right now, and and there's a moving truck out in front of the neighbor's house. And I was worried that while we were talking, that would be distracting. But they're not actually doing anything, so we're good. Um, you know, so so you know, it's like often I'll be in my bedroom where I'm. I, I have no. I mean, I have windows, but I don't look out them. I where I'm when I'm writing on the bed, I'm not looking out the window. Um, uh, then there's the, the living room and the family room. They each have a couch. And so, you know, really, it truly is uh, just sort of where I, I am feeling, feeling it that day. I don't write in public. I don't go to coffee shops or anything like that. I think that'd be way too distracting. I've tried a few times. Um, and, and when my kids were younger and I had to, you know, take them to karate and, and things, I would actually write mm -hmm. then, you know, during karate. Um, but, uh, but now, you know, we're, we're past that stage. So I don't have to write in public and, and which is much easier for me because I'm so easily distracted. Um, mm -hmm. my routine me too. is, <laughs> exactly. My routine is, uh, I try not to go online or check email before I've written 1500 words for the day. Because if I, oh, you're good. Well, I say try. <laughs> so <laughs> sometimes when I have things going on and I know that I might be getting an email, I need to respond to, et cetera, then, then it's much harder. But, but I have found that when I do that, and this means like actually the night before on my laptop, turning off the Wi Fi so that my email doesn't even load. Because if it loads and I see that oh. number there that I have, you know, I have new emails that I haven't looked at, I, I can't focus. I, I have to, you know, so I'll turn off the Wi-Fi the night before. And then, and then I, if I write my 1,500 words before going online or dealing with responding to emails or anything, I, 
I have found that it is much easier for me to get back to work after after that distraction because I'm into the story. I'm already in my characters' heads. But mm. if I check email first, if I go online first, I lose all energy and enthusiasm for working just because just it's, you know, every, you know, it's, it, I'm no longer ready to start my day. And so, so that's, um, I need to do that more. I need to, especially when I'm, when I, with a first draft, that's vital. Um, when, when I'm revising, I, I might not necessarily follow, follow that so much simply because I do already love the story. I love re- revising. Revising is so yeah. much fun. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I get to ask this because um, I, I give people some sample questions and they get to they get to eliminate some. You did not eliminate this one. No. <laughs> Most people do. If your writing were a color, what would it be? Oh. <laughs> um, that's and now funny. you're going to say you meant to eliminate no, it. You no, it was really it was really well. You know, I don't. I, um, it varies from book to book. Um, some books, uh, oh, so that's like- that's why I didn't eliminate because it was like I could see that, you know. So I actually try to match the color of the cover to it. So like Tinderbox was totally red, orange, fire, and hot. So there's you know flames on the cover. So yeah, um, uh, and then other books can kind of feel like a cool blue um, or an earthy. Uh, uh, brown or green, you know, if it's, if it's an earthy mm-hmm. book, we, I try to have the covers shifted more green, um, just because they pop. So yeah, that. <laughs> that's a great answer. I love that. Thank you. So which of your stories has surprised you the most? That's a tough one. I don't, uh, I don't know. Um, what about the one where you had to throw so much out? And tell us what that what that title was. Oh, that's incriminating evidence. And um, actually, so uh, that one was interesting in that, like I said, so I wrote a whole draft and I knew it was terrible. I mean, I, I there were parts that were good, <laughs> but I knew that it needed a lot of work. Um, so I wrote the whole draft, but I realized that one of the problems with it was that I did not have a feel for the setting. And I love researching setting. And that book was set in Alaska. So I took my family to Alaska for a week. (laughs) (laughs) It was great. (laughs) And I came back from Alaska and it was like, okay, now I can write it. (laughs) I've done a number of things for writing. Um, River rafting Mm. is one. I've done, well, of course, shooting and stuff at at the Writers Police Academy. I'm not sure I can say that spinning a car in the pit maneuver was really for writing. (laughs) (laughs) I I love that. I love that. Um, I was too scared to to sign up for that one. Do you you get a lot of um, comments and, and directly to you and readers' emails? And what sort of things do they react to in your stories? Uh, well, recently I had a reader email me after reading um, Catalyst, the one that I was talking about, where at, at the in the author's note I mentioned a, a charity that can be donated to to mm-hmm. to provide uh, sanitary products to young girls, and she she it was the most lovely email because she was like you know I love your stories because of this this and this and this but this really really touched me you know she just I and I really appreciated that oh. she loved that that I had had put that in the author note that, you know, that I included an actionable item (laughs) that could be done after having her mind open to what is the plight of South Sudan. Um, So, so things like that are pretty amazing. And actually, I will, I've gotten some really great feedback from this, from that book along the lines of, of uh, the, the book having a, um, a social conscience about something that we really don't know much about, and yet it also, you know, being this exciting thriller that, <laughs> you know, with, um, and so I really appreciated that. It was uh, because this was definitely, I, you know, I've I've touched on difficult subjects um, in a lot of my books, but this was the first one where where um, it was, you know, it was really highlighting a lot of a, a, a lot of uh, things that going going on in the world. I mean, I, I have my heroine so in the near the beginning of the book, the hero, he's a green beret. He's rescuing her from a slave market in which children are being sold, Mm -hmm. um, which is going on in that part of the world. (laughs) And so, yeah, it's, it, it was, uh, 
it was hard to write, but um, but I'm very I'm in, in, incredibly proud of it for for the, for the scope of what it covers, and um, and I've and I've you should be thank you yeah <laughs> yeah that's terrific and that and when a reader recognizes that and takes the time to let you know that means so much yeah that's wonderful yeah. yeah. And I I, I love these questions from the readers. I I think they're so interesting. So um, this reader has asked, if you could write a book with any other author, alive or dead, who would you want to work with and why? Well, you know, it, it, it took me some time to think to, to think of what my answer would be for that. And then the moment I, uh, the name popped into my head, it was like, well, of course, <laughs> you know, I don't even know why I'd hesitate. Um, it would be Elizabeth Peters, um, who passed away a few years ago, also oh, known as, uh, yeah. Barbara Michaels. Um, and it's actually, right. I blame Elizabeth Peters for the fact that I'm an archeologist. Um, so <laughs> It is our creditor. <laughs> yeah, creditor. <exactly. laughs> uh, I, yeah, I read uh, uh, Street of the Five Moons, one of her Vicki Bliss stories, uh, my senior year in high school, and was just hooked. I, uh, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm a minority. I'm gonna confess, I, I'm not as much into the Amelia Peabody stories. Um, I'm sure that they're delightful and lovely, but it, they, that just never captured me as much as her, Vicki Bliss and, and. Um, and then her and, and Jacqueline Kirby and, and those books. And then just a lot of those little one-off yeah. mysteries that were just so fun. And so, yeah, you know. Shattered Silk oh, was the one yes. I loved. You know, Shattered, you actually Shattered Silk. Okay, so here's the thing. Um, I, I'm looking on my shelf to see if it's there. I remember buying, I think it's that one, that I bought at. Costco and and I picked it up because I was like oh my gosh it's another Barbara Michaels I believe is, is the name that, that yeah that one was published under yes. and it was another one yeah. and I was at Costco and I looked at the back of the book and her main character was named Rachel Grant in the back cover copy and <laughs> I was so excited I and, don't know but then that. when I was oh, reading fine. the book they 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 I think her last name only shows up like once in the book and it wasn't Grant. I can't remember what it was. I, I, I should dig up my copy. But I remember it was like, it was like you know, just a, a mix up between the back cover copy and the book, probably because she basically never used the last name. Um, and so it didn't really matter. So so we should have asked the question of when when the back cover copy does yes, not accurately reflect the book. <laughs> and you buy it because you're like, this is my idol. And she's written a book about me. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm early and she lived in the DC area. She lived in Maryland, I think. And I met her a couple times, just very oh, briefly. So, in passing. so what a envious. Lovely I'm so envious. She, I, she would really never want lovely. to write with me. My books are racier and my characters curse and all of that. But still, I, 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 I love her greatly. I admire her so much. <laughs> Oh, she had a bit of a wicked twinkle oh, in her excellent. eyes. Oh, she might. <laughs> <laughs> For people who are new to you, haven't read any of your books, do you have one or two that you think are, are really good introductions to to how you write and to the stories that are that the kind of the feel of the stories that a reader would get from you? Well, I I try to structure my series books so that you can jump in at any point. Um, but I would say that in the evidence series, um, uh, book five has a thread that's picked up in book seven and book six has a thread that's picked up in book seven. So like if you were going to just jump in at a random point in the evidence series, you could really pick any book before book five, but then you might, you know, want to start with five if that's, you know, I mean, the others work, you could read them standalone, mm. but, but you get a few more spoilers. Cause I try to keep the spoilers out, you know, the, as for as much as possible. So I would say that, and, and book five is covert evidence um, in that series. Um, for the flashpoint series, I would, say tinderbox the first book in the series just because it you know it, again they can be read out of order but you know there's only three books so you may as well start with the first one <laughs> well and they build yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and firestorm the one that's going to be coming out next is very much a direct sequel to catalyst so mm. do you have any books that you think that um get overlooked more than than um, your others cold that evidence for whatever yeah, reason. Cold, Cold Evidence is the sixth hmm. book in the Evidence series. And 
Um, and I just love that book. It just, it was easy to write. It's set in my yeah. home state. Um, it's got underwater which archaeology, is? which, uh, you know, it might. What's your home oh, state? Washington state. <laughs> Oh, it is Washington yeah. State. Okay. I knew you'd live there now. Yeah. I well, I, I call it my home state. Um, I, I've actually lived uh, I, seven years in California, seven years in Michigan, seven years in Florida. So I didn't move here wow. until I was 21. Um, and then since I've, I've, I've lived here most of the time since I was 21, with the exception of three years in Hawaii and two years in D.C. So I've lived here longer than anywhere else. But um, so it's it's as home as anything, <laughs> and it's where you know. Yeah, I have this theory though that wherever you're sort of formed remains. So I'm I consider myself a Midwesterner, mm -hmm. even though I spent longer in the D.C. area. Mm -hmm chronologically than anywhere else, but I'm still a Midwesterner. I will still talk to strangers. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I used to, I used to feel a really strong connection to Michigan because that was, you know, age of seven to 14. I went, you know, from elementary school to high school mm. there. But, um, as the years go on, you know, it feels so much more distant now. <laughs> okay. Is there anything I have not asked you that you, that I should have, or that you would like to answer? Well, uh, you, the question of, uh, before I wanted to be a writer, what did I want to be? And, okay. um, I, when I was, um, in elementary school, I wanted to be Olivia Newton, John, but that thought was taken. <laughs> <laughs> I so wanted to be her. <laughs> Princess Leah and Olivia Newton, John. <laughs> okay. Interesting um, combination. <laughs> and so then, um, then after that, when, you know, I, I did want to be a singer, which, uh, and that lasted through high school. And I even took voice lessons. Now I'm not a good singer. <laughs> so I had to give up that dream. And by my senior year in high school, I um, knew that I wanted to be a writer. I was doing creative writing. I was the editor of my high school's literary magazine. And I, I knew that writing was what I wanted to do. But then when I went to college, um, and I, I, I was a, an English major, you know, declared when I went off to college. But when I went there, I um, realized, you know, I, this is the hubris of, of an 18-year-old, where I was like, wait a minute, here I have this opportunity to study anything. I already know how to write. <laughs> Why would I want to spend money on that? I should learn about something that really interests and excites me so that then I'll have fodder for writing later. And so I was like, I love Elizabeth Peters. I love her books. Um, and she writes about, you know, anthropology and archaeology. I think that would be really cool. And then I looked up in the, the catalog for the coming semester's classes. And intro to physical anthropology was taught by Professor Elizabeth Peters. <laughs> Oh my gosh, meant to, be. <laughs> meant to and be. So I was just like, all right, that's it. <laughs> so there you go. I love it. I love so that's it. That's why <laughs> it clearly was meant to be. It was. <laughs> so tell tell the listeners where they can find out more about you and your books. Um, well, my website is uh, www.rachel-grant.net, and that's Rachel, R-A-C-H-E-L. And then I'm at all of the major online retailers, um, and you can find links on my website for that. And then also nine of my books are available at Audible. So you can oh, listen terrific. to <laughs> and we will have links to, to Rachel's website and some social media type stuff on the show notes too for folks. Um, and now we get to do my very fav favorite part, the either or questions. Um, so it was rapid fire. Let's just go. I'm going to say daisies or roses? Uh, roses. Hot air balloon or train trip? Oh, train. Are you afraid of heights? No, I just love trains. Although now I'm thinking about okay. it. I'm like, oh, hot air balloon would be really cool. No, <laughs> no I, I, I love trains. <laughs> yeah, and I should not ask you that because I, the, the idea is to have you pick one or the other. And here I'm, I'm <laughs> drawing you out to, to go to the other way. Cat or dog? Cat. House decorating or gardening? House decorating. 
Paint or wallpaper? Paint. Thank you. Coffee or tea? (laughs) (laughs) Coffee. Winter Olympics or Summer Olympics? Winter, for sure. Yay. Nail polish (laughs) or bare nails? Uh, Commentary here. I, I, um... I love nail polish. I never remember to put it on. <laughs> okay, we'll do. Let's do a writing police academy one. Pit maneuver or shooting? Shooting. That's what I did. <laughs> <laughs> I did long gun and short gun. Oh, do you did well? Long gun or short gun? Uh huh. Um. Oh, I was better with the long gun, but I think everyone is. So, but. But they were both interesting. Not me. So I can, I, I'm going to say long gun just because it's less scary. Like you can't turn it on yourself. <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, day or night? Um, uh, day. Opera or show tunes? Show tunes. Paper plates or best china? Best china. Pickup or sports car? Uh, Hmm. Pick up. Hiking boots or cowboy boots? Hiking. Spring or fall? Fall. Ice cream or cake? My birthday's in the fall. (laughs) Uh, Ice cream. (laughs) (laughs) And the last one. Grab the best first or save the best for last? Save the best for last. Thank you so much, Rachel. I really appreciate your being on on the podcast and getting to spend this time with you, more time. And neither one of us had a weapon. (laughs) 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 We still had fun. How do you like that? Um, (laughs) And I I hope, oh, this is a lot of fun. I hope the, the listeners will come back next week to meet another author and get to know them a little better and the stories behind the stories. In the meantime, have a great week of reading. That's the show for this week. Hope you enjoyed it. And thank you for joining Authors Love Readers podcast. Remember, you can always find out more about our guest authors in the show notes. And you can find out more about me at www.patriciamclin.com. You can also send in questions to be asked of future authors at podcast at authorslovereaders.com. Until next week, wishing you lots of happy reading. Bye. If you like this podcast, we hope you'll consider becoming a supporter through our Patreon page. With a small monthly donation as little as a dollar a month, you can help with the hosting and editing costs that make the show possible. To thank our Patreon supporters, we offer them special bonuses. Find out more at authorslovereaders.com or at patreon.com slash authorslovereaders. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. We also hope you'll subscribe to this podcast and leave us a review wherever you listen to us. Both of those help more folks find the podcast. Of course, the very best way for other folks to find the podcast is for you to tell them about it. So we sure hope you will.